All right, guys, so starting off, we've got ourselves a 1956 Heister YE40 forklift. You saw I had my battery jump box helping me get this thing into the shop. Although this engine ran, the clutch was completely seized up. So what I did was remove all four spark plugs so that I could then put it into gear and then use the starter to slowly limp it into the shop because this thing is very heavy. Now, at the time I was starting this project, I didn't know exactly how deep I was going to go into this. I knew that I wanted to upgrade the engine and then fix everything that I found that was broken along the way and so I really just started taking things apart to see what kind of shape everything was in. Now, given that this forklift is 67 years old, I wasn't expecting a ton of really cool engineering as I was taking it apart, but I was pleasantly surprised when I removed the top cover for the transmission here, and I found out that this was designed so that you could replace the entire clutch without having to separate the engine from the transmission. I've never seen that before, but I absolutely love it. Basically, you remove a few bolts from the input shaft bearing retainer, slide the input shaft forward into the differential, and then you can actually pull out the clutch, the pressure plate, the throwout bearing, you can even get to the flywheel that way. Now, I didn't end up doing that because I was pulling the engine out anyways, but I absolutely love that design. So I'm hoping somebody in the comment section below can tell me exactly what type of engine this is. I have it narrowed down to a Continental Y112 or an F162, but I don't know enough about the old Continentals to be able to tell the difference. This is another cool piece of engineering. This is a belt driven 90 degree gearbox so that the radiator fan can be driven by the engine but mounted sideways so that the radiator can be tucked into this little cubby here. And up next is the fuel tank. This thing used to drive me nuts because the pickup tube on it was very high. So I'd have to put in two gallons of fuel before it would pick it up and it is a vented tank so it would evaporate. So it was constantly running empty. And look at how much filth is on this forklift. I cannot emphasize how dirty this thing was. And it's the worst kind of dirt too because it would get stuck in your shoes and it'd get drug all over the place because it's just kind of that oily, dirty mess. All right, so up next is removing the original hydraulic pump. According to the manual, that put out 12.9 gallons per minute at up to 2,500 PSI. And then I remove all of the fittings for the spool valve so I can get the hydraulic tank out where I find even more dirt and grease. And I'll tell you what, I still have nightmares about how dirty this thing was. Up next on the front here, I am removing the side shift. I will not be reinstalling this on the forklift. It was not operational while I had it, and I found that it wasn't really necessary for what I was using it for. And so I thought, you know what, get rid of the complexities. I'll eliminate a ton of fittings, a ton of hoses, make it just a lot simpler and cleaner, and scrap it. Up next here is removing the tilt cylinders. Luckily, these things were in fantastic shape. They did not leak a drop, but I will have to replace the pins that hold them in. So I was trying to figure out how to remove the front mast. And so I looked at the original repair manual and it showed that if you jacked the forklift up high enough, you could actually drop the mast all the way to the ground and then remove it on the floor. So that's exactly what I did and it worked out perfectly. So it was about this point of the disassembly that I realized that somebody had done a decent amount of work to this forklift in the past. On the inner mast here on the bottom, it had worn completely through the strip bearings and into the metal, so somebody had welded up a little plate. And then on the main mast, you could see that the fitting mounts for the side shift were added on after the fact, and they also cut away a few little pieces of the carriage in order to make that work. So while I had the forklift still on jacks, I wanted to take a look at the bearings for the rear steering. And so I pulled the bearing cap off. It looked fantastic in there. The bearings looked basically brand new. So I packed it with fresh grease, put the cap back on and called it good. Guys, this isn't even the final cleaning on this forklift. This is just the pressure washing to get this thing clean enough to get it back into the shop so that I can then do the final cleaning on it. I mean, look at how disgusting this hydraulic tank is. Now the spool valve and the hydraulic tank were obviously designed together. So there is a single O-ring that connect the two so that the hydraulic fluid can go immediately back into the tank. I will be adding a filter to this system later and a different spool valve. So I will have to make some adjustments to that when the time comes. Now somehow this canopy had a huge ding in it. So I used my floor anchors and some heat and some gentle massaging to get that bent back into place. And then I removed the front tires and then separated the tires from the wheels. Found out that these things have the split rim design that people like to call the Widowmaker. Makes it very easy to change out the tires, but also somewhat dangerous. 
Up next is the axle removal. Luckily, these are full floating axles, so I can remove them without having to open up the pumpkin. You simply remove all of the nuts, and then there are two holes that are already threaded for half inch fine thread bolts. So you tighten up those bolts, it pushes the axle out. You can then remove those little wedges and then pull the axle right out. Now once again, you can tell that somebody's been in here before because the bearing retainers were a little bit beat up, but the bearings were in great shape. Next up is brake removal. It was pretty straightforward. I did wear a respirator because these almost certainly still have asbestos in them. Next up is removal of the horn and then our master cylinder. This happened to be the same master cylinder that came in a CJ5 Jeep, oddly enough. Then we've got our parking brake and then our shifter linkage. This is on the bottom of the steering gearbox. And then above that are the actual shifters themselves. The top one goes forward to reverse and then the bottom one goes from first gear to second gear. And then in the background, you see I've got a little fake trophy truck that I built using a Crown Vic chassis. If you guys have not seen that build video, I'll put a link to that in the description below. While I'm up here, I decided to pull off all the gauges and then I went back to finishing up the steering. I did not think that I'd be able to fit my pitman arm puller in there. And even if I could, I didn't think I'd be able to get enough torque on it, but luckily that popped right off so I could finish up pulling the gearbox out. Up next is removal of the front diff cover. I was a little surprised to see two super long bolts in the top left corner there. Those go all the way through the axle and into the transmission. Once it was opened up, I took a look at the ring and pinion. They were both in great shape. I tested the backlash on that ring, 12 thousandths of an inch, right at factory spec on a 67 year old forklift. Next up is removal of the transmission cover. I had to put that back on while I was pressure washing just to keep the water out, but then I had to remove it before I split the transmission from the axle because there's two bolts that I couldn't access other otherwise. Now this axle is able to swing down because it's held in place on the front with just these two pins. On the back side, of course, it is bolted to the transmission, which is then bolted to the engine, which is then bolted to a cross member. These are all the parts that I have no intention on reinstalling. If they're in good shape, I'll clean them up and sell them on eBay. If they're in bad shape, unfortunately, they'll end up in the scrapyard. Here's all the parts that I do plan on reinstalling. Some of it will need to be cleaned up, but mostly it's good to go. Here's all the new parts that I bought so far. Next up, I wanted to get a little bit of work done on this body. It's a little bit counterproductive because I do have to do a full primer and paint job later, but it was just so unbelievably dirty. And as I was cleaning it, I kept getting more and more bare metal exposed. So I figured now is the time to get this thing as clean as possible. I'll get a simple coat of epoxy primer over it just to protect anything that's bare metal and give me a nice clean surface to work with. And then that way, if I have to grind through it a little bit to weld, no big deal. And I can do the final paint later. You know, the two things that my kids care about the most whenever I'm building a project are wiping things down and wet sanding. For some reason, they just cannot get enough of it. All right, now it's time to really dig into this project. I decided to start with the steering because I knew that there was a really bad rough spot. Unfortunately, somebody has been in here before, a bearing had gone out and instead of replacing it, they put a washer in its place and it kind of worked its way through that and ground up the gears. This thing is basically a unicorn as far as sourcing a replacement. So I decided to go ahead and convert it to hydraulic steering. <laughs> 
Next up is the transmission. I've got to get this thing as clean as possible before I do any work to it. The plan is to convert this from a manual to essentially a hydrostatic transmission. And I will do that by replacing the engine that drove it with a hydraulic motor. Now it is going to reduce the top speed by about 75%, but it will increase the torque and it should make it a lot more controllable at those slow speeds. Now in order to do this conversion, I do need the adapter that connected the engine to the transmission. So I'm pulling off the old flywheel here so that I can get access to that, get that cleaned up and then mounted back to the transmission. Next up is making an adapter for the hydraulic motor, which is sitting on the table to the right there in order to adapt it to the transmission. So I start off with paper and then turn it into steel. Please don't tell my wife that I used her pot lid for my plasma cutter guide. So these three holes that I'm drilling here, these will bolt up to the same holes that the engine did, but I will have to add one more to the top of this adapter just to make it a little bit stronger. So I decided to start off with a 5 16 drill bit, send it all the way through the adapter into the cast iron, and then I switch it out for a 3 8 drill bit, and I go through just the top part of the adapter here, and then I send my tap through just to have it nice and guided in straight. I finish that off by hand. The purpose for this is that the top bolt bolts directly into that adapter and and it's uh, perfectly straight so that I can then rotate the bottom a little bit like a pendulum in case I don't end up being absolutely spot on with uh, lining up the shaft. If it's off by just a little bit, it'll vibrate like crazy. So this will give me just that little bit of adjustability, make it a little bit simpler. And then I use my hydraulic knockout punch to knock out a hole that will then fit our hydraulic motor into. Next, I have to cut the very tip of the input shaft to make everything fit. This portion used to ride in the very back of the crankshaft on a brass bushing. It's no longer necessary because the way I am going to use the adapter for the hydraulic motor, it will keep that input shaft from moving. I'm using a hole saw to cut out the center of the original clutch disc so that I can then take it over to Gavin's because he is better with a lathe than I am so that he can take just a little bit off the edge so we can then use a sleeve to mount it to the hydraulic motor adapter. All right, moving on to the axle, I start off by hammering out the outer bushings. Unfortunately, on both sides, the inner bushings were completely destroyed. You will soon find out why. On the one side, I was able to use a wheel cylinder hone to clean up the hole just enough to mount some new bushings. On the other side, it was a little bit more beat up. So I started off with an 80 grit flapper wheel, and then I moved to a 120 grit. That enlarged it just enough so that I could install some oversized bushings. For the bushings, I went with oil impregnated high load iron bushings that I got from McMaster. So here we find out the reason for the damaged bushing. Basically, a portion of the ear of the main mast had broken off. Luckily, that piece was still stuck inside, so I was able to find that when I was removing it. I think it was due to a design flaw. Basically, a pin slides through the center there and is held in place by a bolt. That bolt clamps down that portion of the ear, but as you can see, it was weak enough to be damaged. So I decided to change up the style a little bit. What I did was weld that little part back on and then I started using the grinder to cut a nice little groove so that I could then fill the weld in to make sure it got all the way into the center. And then I welded up that little hole at the top and then I welded up the entire bolt hole. So it's now basically one solid chunk of steel. 
In order to hold the new pin in place, I decided to drill a hole in the bottom and then tap it, and then I'll use a bolt to hold that pin. It makes it stronger in my opinion, but I guess only time will tell. I will say it is very helpful to have a wife that will come out into the garage and help me lift up an axle, even while wearing a dress. Now the center holes on the mast are still unfinished after the welding, so my plan was to send an inch and a quarter drill bit through using the bushings as a guide and then send a wheel cylinder hone through to get everything nice and smooth and then the center pin. Luckily it worked as intended, so I then cut the pins to the right size, cleaned up the edges a little bit, and then I cut a small groove in the center followed by a pilot hole. The point of the pilot hole is so that when I then send the bolt through the bottom, it holds the pin in place. That way the pin rotates on the bushings and not on the main lift. I did grind a little arrow in the end, that way I would know exactly where that pilot hole was, just to make installation a little bit easier. So here I am testing out the locking bolt. I gotta say, I feel a lot better about the strength on that flange. I did grind down the tip of the bolt to try to match the angle of the drill bit as close as possible. Here I am chasing all the threads for our axle, just to make it a little bit easier for the installation. Up next, we've got our brakes. They were pretty straightforward. They looked basically the same as every other set of heavy duty drum brakes out there. You've got two wheel cylinders, two shoes, two sets of springs, basically two of everything. I was really hopeful when I got the wheel cylinders removed that I would find a part number on them that corresponded to a replacement part that was like $12 per cylinder. That way I didn't have to rebuild them. Unfortunately, the cheapest set I could find were $150 a piece. And since there are four of them, that would be $600 for the front end. And and since it has a hydrostatic transmission now, the brakes are basically useless. I'm only going to use them to hold it in place for short times. So I thought, you know what, I'll just use my trusty wheel cylinder hone, clean these things out a little bit, and then get a rebuild kit. They were an inch and an eighth bore, so rebuild kits were pretty readily available, even if they weren't exactly for this model. So I just threw them back together and we were good to go. 
Now I did have to make my own parking brake cable for the right side because the original one was damaged. So I used a 3 16 stainless steel cable and then I soldered on a fitting. I learned this trick from Gavin over at Death Toll Racing. He did it on his safari wagon and that thing's been going strong for about three years now. All right, up next is designing the new hydraulic steering system. I started off by mounting back the factory steering arm and then measuring where I wanted the new pivoting point to be. I cut off what was left of the front and then I started figuring out where I wanted to locate the new bell crank. I then found this nut that was designed for connecting two pieces of all thread together. So it's basically just a very long nut. It fit inside that steering arm perfectly and then I mounted a heim joint. I then used some heavy wall two inch square tubing to start building the bell crank. Here I'm using a step up bit so that I can install a sleeve into the backside of the bell crank. The purpose for this is just to make it stronger. This backside is gonna be mounted to the forklift with a brass bushing on the top and the bottom, and I will need to tighten it down pretty good so that there's no slack in it. So I just need to make this thing as over-engineered and beefy as possible. Up next, I'm cleaning up the steering arm so that I can slide that all thread nut into it and then get that welded up. Next up is drilling the hole for the heim joint. Now the steering is actually going to be on the top of the bell crank and then the hydraulic ram is going to be in the center. Unfortunately, I couldn't get them to line up perfectly. So I do have to add some reinforcements to make sure everything's strong. So once we got this all mounted up, everything worked as intended. We ended up with about 10 and a half inches of travel on the steering side. Our hydraulic ram for the steering is 10 inches. So I will mount that just a little bit closer to the pivoting point on the forklift. Here I'm welding up the reinforcement for the bottom of the bell crank. Here we are drilling the holes for the hydraulic ram mount into some 3 16 round plate. So before I did the final welding on the bell crank here, I did have everything shimmed up exactly how it will be on the forklift. I used the same bronze bushings that I'll use once it's fully installed to get everything just as perfectly straight as possible to try to eliminate any excessive wear. All right, here's the moment of truth where we find out if the 10 inches of travel on the hydraulic ram matches the 10 and a half inches of travel on our steering. Now I do have a little bit of adjustability on the heim joint on the steering end, but that will only help center it. It won't actually give it more or less travel. Luckily, everything lined up perfectly. So I use my little Viver mag drill here to cut through that half inch plate. And then I add a reinforcement on the bottom. 
This right here ended up being my favorite part of the entire build. I'm welding up a small mechanical steering indicator so that from the driver's seat, I can simply look down to my left and know the exact position of my rear tires. And I know that because the indicator rides through this little crescent shaped hole that I'm cutting in the side plate. Next up, I am cutting some round plate to use to fill in the hole for the air inlet as well as the fuel filler. All right, now we're back to the hydraulic tank where I start off by adding a half inch NPT bung to the tank inlet. This will allow me to install a remote mount hydraulic filter system later on. I then cut off the factory suction tube where I find out that was not actually the factory suction tube. Somebody had modified this in the past, but I kind of liked what they did for the suction tube. So I ended up leaving that on the inside where it will pick up the hydraulic fluid from the bottom half inch or so. I did have to weld a little plate there just to fix uh, somebody else's poor weld job in the past and then I added a three-quarter NPT bung so that I could then screw on a barbed fitting I didn't know if I was going to go with the straight fitting or a 45 or a 90 at the time so I thought going with the NPT will allow me to change it up I am adding one little inlet here on the top it is going to be a 3 8 NPT I don't know if I'm going to need it or not but I figured it was better to have another tank inlet now rather than needing one in the future and having to cut and grind and weld on an already painted tank Before I sealed this tank up, I did install a small magnet in the bottom that was designed for use in a transmission pan. The purpose for that is to just pick up any tiny little metal shavings that find their way through. So this tank used to have just the screen with no magnet and no filter. Now we're going to have an external filter. We still have the screen and we've got the magnet. So it should help keep our hydraulic fluid nice and clean. All right, now that it's time to do a little bit of cleaning and wet sanding, the kids are back. So I did add just a small amount of body filler to those two holes that I plugged up, and then we gave this thing a good scrub down, getting it ready for paint. For primer, I use my 3M AccuSpray gun because the cleanup on it is basically instant and I can change out the tips quickly depending on which type of primer I'm spraying. All right, we are ready for our first color of this project. We are going with Fire Mist Red. It's a heavy metallic acrylic enamel from the restoration shop. I usually use their acrylic urethane, but I've been wanting to try the enamel for a while and I figured this was a perfect project for it. I do understand it is a little ridiculous to paint an entire transaxle with this beautiful candy apple red, but hey, it's my project and I can do what I want. And here comes the main color for the project. This is Buckskin Tan, once again from the Restoration Shop. And this is a color that I have wanted to use for many years now because I've always been obsessed with those pickup trucks from the 1970s that were some variant of a tan or a brown color. And then they would do three stripes down the side, usually like a yellow, orange, red, or an orange, red, brown color. The Fords and the Toyotas come to mind mostly for doing that color scheme. I thought that that would look really cool on this forklift. And that is part of the reason why 
why I painted the transaxle that red color. When I do the three stripes, we'll do orange and then red and then brown. And then the red will actually line up with that front axle that will stick out through the wheel. So it'll kind of carry that color all the way through. Ah, it's back to our Widowmaker rims. The reason these are so dangerous is because if you pop that ring off while it is under pressure, it can come off with extreme force and decapitate a fellow. The other problem is that when you are installing them, if you don't get the ring fully seated and then you fill it up with air, they can then pop off. So what I did was fill the tires up to 20 PSI just to have them nice and seated on that rim and then mounted it to the transmission. And then I roll it up and install it. Luckily, the splits are on the inside. So when I fill it up to the full 100 PSI, if there were any problem with these rims and they happen to blow off, they would blow inward and I would not be decapitated and turn my wife into a widow. The design for the rear wheels are a little bit different. They're two-piece rims that bolt together in the center. They're a lot safer than the split rims that are on the front, but you still need to make sure that it's not under pressure when you are unbolting them. Now I have replaced the inner tubes for the rear before, and I've also repacked these bearings and inspected the hubs. They were in fantastic shape. So all I had to do was give it a quick spray paint coat and we were good to go. 
up next, I'm installing the parking brake cables. And I don't know if you guys remember just how dirty this area was during disassembly, but it was so nasty that I didn't even know these brackets existed until I got through like three inches of crud. The brake line on the right side was in great shape. Unfortunately, the left side was rubbing against something over the years, and although it wasn't leaking yet, I figured it was only a matter of time, so I decided to make a new brake line. I did that by cutting off the old fittings and then sliding them onto the new brake line, and then I used my brake flaring tool in order to put a nice little flare on it, and then I bent it into shape using my Eastwood bender. If you guys see me using any of these tools and you want to know where to get them, I do try to put most of them in my Amazon store. You can find a link to that in the description below. If you go to the store and you don't find the tool, just write in the comment section below what tool you're looking for, and then I will try to add it to that list. And here's the new master cylinder that was made for a CJ5 Jeep. Up next, we have to make a custom transmission mount to mount the transmission directly to the forklift. The purpose for this is because the transmission used to bolt to the engine, which then bolted to a cross member. Since we've eliminated the engine, the transmission is now floating on those front pins. So we're building this little trapezoidal piece to mount to the side of the transmission. We'll then use an angled piece of square tubing down to the forklift, drill some holes into the forklift, and we'll be good to go. Next up, we have to make our new engine cross member. And for that, I'm using five by two heavy walled rec tube and cutting it with my evolution saw. We do need to move the engine forward from those factory mounts that are in the back there. And it's going to be clocked just a little bit of an angle to give me easier access to that hydraulic motor in the future. So I built up this little adapter platform. Those four holes will then go to rubber isolators, which will then bolt up to our brand new engine. And this is where this project is really going to start to get controversial because I will be installing a single cylinder 420cc Harbor Freight Predator engine mounted to what is essentially a 13 gallon per minute log splitter hydraulic pump. <laughs> 
Now this engine comes with oil drain plugs on both sides, so I decided to drill out and then tap one of those drain plugs so that I could install a temperature sending unit. This allows me to monitor the temperature of the engine oil because this is an air-cooled engine. The reason I ended up going with this setup, I love that the engine is completely standalone. It has basically everything you need to operate it already on it. And then both the engine and the hydraulic pump are very available, inexpensive, and they're known for their reliability. So if anything goes wrong, I can swap out a hydraulic pump or quite frankly, the entire engine in a day. So here I am modifying the dash, getting it ready to accept our new steering configuration. I went through a few different designs for the steering in my head before I finally settled on this. I started off thinking that I would install an orbital valve, but I was having trouble finding one that could handle the pressure to keep it in the same loop as the other hydraulic system. A spool valve seemed like the most simple way to go, so that's what I ended up going with. I have been operating this forklift for a few weeks now with this configuration, and I absolutely love it. Unfortunately, adding that plate did take away a few of the gauge locations so I decided to add one more on the end. I ended up going with an hour meter and then we've got a voltage meter and then two temperature sensors. The first one is for the hydraulic fluid and then the one on the end is for the engine oil. I wanted to monitor the hydraulic fluid temperature because I wasn't sure if adding this hydraulic motor to the system was going to increase the temperature of that. Here is our remote mount hydraulic fluid filter. I'm mounting it basically where the fuel filler neck used to be. All of the fluid that passes through our hydraulic system does go through this filter before it goes back into the tank. It's a 10 micron filter, so it should help keep our system nice and clean. After I filled the tank up with five gallons of hydraulic fluid, I did have to do a little bit of electrical work so that I could extend the switch from the side of the engine up to the dash. This motor is equipped with an electric starter, but it also has a pull start. And I actually have not hooked up the electric starter yet because the pull start works so well. Another benefit to not having the battery, it's one more battery that I don't need to keep charged. And there's no possibility that I'm going to mess up my hour meter by accidentally leaving the switch in the on position and letting it run forever. Next up is making a custom exhaust so we can get those fumes away from our engine bay. So I start off by making a pair of flanges so that I can then weld one side directly to our factory muffler and then the other side can be welded to a length of exhaust tubing that routes it in the same location as the factory exhaust, which is really just straight out the back. All right, here we go, ready for our first start. And it started on the first pull, that is very good. The next thing I want to test is while the transmission is in neutral, I wanna activate our hydraulic motor to see if the shaft is spinning correctly and if it's perfectly straight. So here we go. All right, everything is looking perfect so far. Let's go ahead and put this thing in gear and see if it moves. Ah, look at how happy this little guy is. And we are at 400 PSI here. This does go up to 3000 PSI. So I'm basically just testing it at idle. All right, good first test. All right, now that everything tested good, let's just finish up this paint job so we can get this thing put together. 
do have to make a pair of new tilt cylinder pins because the old ones were a little bit worn and then I have to cut a little keyed groove into them so that this square piece of steel can hold them into place. So here's the old chain and the other old chain after an ultrasonic cleaning and then a quick pressure wash. I did soak both chains in 30 weight oil for a couple of weeks as per the manufacturer's recommendations. If you guys are finding this build interesting, specifically all the hydraulics on it, I'd like to recommend another channel. My buddy Vinny B just finished building a custom backhoe. He built it from scratch, including all of the hydraulics, and it was a tremendous amount of work. It's a fantastic three-part series. I'll put a link to that in the description below. You should definitely check that out. But before you do, I'd like to recommend that you check out my ice cream truck build if you haven't already, because I spent way more time building that than I did building this, and nobody watched the video, so that makes me sad. So go check that out and then go to Vinnie B's. Next up is finishing the floor pan. If you guys remember, this vehicle used to have a clutch. It also used to have a steering gearbox down there. Since it no longer has those, I decided to fill those in. So I'm using some scrap diamond plate that I had for that. I also needed to cut a round hole in the bottom. That is going to be for my pressure gauge for my hydraulic system so I can look down from the seat, see what pressure we're at. I also added a few flanges to the bottom to make it a little bit easier for the seat to mount. Here I'm using a spray-on bed liner. It's the same one that I use on the pizza trucks that I build. All right guys, so while I was editing this video, I got to this next part here and I had absolutely no memory of doing any of this. I didn't even know what I was making and I'm the one that made it. So I wanna see how long it takes you guys to figure out what's going on here. I start off with three quarter inch square tubing. I weld on a couple of plates to the side and then it looks like I'm just drilling holes all willy nilly. I then head over to my evolution saw where the recommended cut is no less than one inch and obviously this is a lot less than that so I'm being very careful. I cut it into to three pieces and then I head over to my sander. So I've now got three pieces that are shaped like the letter A. I still had absolutely no idea, didn't remember any of this. I then head over to the wire wheel, clean them up, and then I clamp them down to my welding table where I then remember what in the world I'm doing. I'm using 3 8 inch round tube in order to weld it into the adapters so that I can then put it on my vise and use my die to then put a nice little thread on the end so that I can then use this little brass adapter which is made for a shift knob. That way I can have these long levers to activate my spool valve. Now the reason I couldn't just thread the end and screw them directly into the spool valve is because they all had to be off-centered a little bit based on the location of that seat. <laughs> 
All right, guys, here we are. She is all done. And I have to say, I think this is the most beautiful forklift I've ever seen in my life. And of course, that does not matter at all if this thing does not work as a proper forklift. So let's get this thing outside so we can test it and see how it does at its actual job. This is the first time this forklift has been outside the shop since I was pressure washing it about three months ago. So I start off by doing some little circles here. Mostly I'm just trying to get a feel for the steering. I will say my favorite thing is still that steering indicator that tells me the exact location of those rear tires. It makes navigating, especially at slow speeds, much easier. The first thing I lifted was the bucket from my backhoe. It had no problems with that. So of course I then move on to what is the heaviest thing that I need to move, which is my 1952 International one and a half ton truck with a school bus body on it. I need to get it into the shop so I can turn the school bus into a playhouse for my kids. I don't know how much this setup weighs. I'm guessing around 8,000 pounds. It would have been easier to move if either of us had figured out that it was still in gear. So I was dragging it along. The lifting capacity is exactly the same as it was before, 5,000 pounds. Nothing was changed there. Now let's talk speed. This here, this is the actual speed that I was traveling at. Everything else was sped up by about eight times. I wasn't going full speed, but I just wanted to show you guys how slow this thing is. That is obviously the biggest problem with this forklift. Doesn't bother me at all. I don't care how slow it is. I only really use this forklift for moving a few things around the yard occasionally, and then of course, whenever I get a shipment in. So I'm not loading up like a full truck and zipping across the yard to where I need to have a lot of speed. I just need this thing to be super reliable, and I want it to be as efficient as possible, and I think I I totally nailed it. I'd like to do a follow-up video on this forklift, so if you guys have any questions, write those in the comments section below, and I'll try to get to those in the follow-up. Otherwise, go check out my ice cream truck video, and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.